Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 31 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me, as always, is my good friend, Pervez Ahmed. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming back. Uh, we've uh, gotten some uh, good feedback on our last episode. People seem to have really enjoyed uh, the interview we did with Professor Lombard. Um, that was a real honor for us, and I think more and more people are checking out uh, the study Quran. And there's been a lot of conversations around it. So we're pretty excited that we were able to bring that to you. Uh, but I would have to say that uh, probably not as excited as I am sitting here right now with our guest for this episode, Zucky. Well, we're very excited and very honored to be joined by Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah. And Dr. Omar Abdullah is an American Muslim who embraced Islam in 1970. He studied Arabic and Islamic studies at the University of Chicago and received his doctorate there in 1978. He taught at the universities of Windsor, Temple, Michigan, and King Abdulaziz in Jeddah. During several years abroad, he was able to study with a number of traditional Islamic scholars. He returned to the United States in 2000 under the auspices of the Nawi Foundation in Chicago, where he worked until 2011. He taught Islamic studies at Darul Qasim in Chicago from 2012 until 2013, and he's currently engaged in independent research, writing, and teaching activities with institutions across the United States, Europe, and Africa with a focus on Islamic theology. And I just want to say on a, on a personal level, when I lived in Chicago, I used to attend Dr. Omer's classes regularly, so this is a, a very huge honor, uh, certainly for me, and I know I can speak for Pervez when I say uh, the feeling is mutual there as well. Absolutely. Uh, welcome, Dr. Armour. Thank you very much. Uh, it really is an honor for you to join, uh, for, for us to have you as a guest. Um, God, there's so many things we, we, I think we do want to unpack and talk about. Uh, but uh, if you could, you know, just sort of talk maybe a little bit about uh, your, early, you know, sort of early childhood growing up and uh, some of your, uh, you know, earliest memories. I was born in Nebraska and in the formative early years of my life, I was very much influenced by the culture of Nebraska and western Kansas. My mother and her family were from western Kansas, and my family was mostly from central and western Nebraska. Um, I think that those years were very, very important. Uh, the environment that we lived in was one that I think I regard as very pure and very down-to-earth, and very simple. And I think a lot of the val values that uh, I was taught and imbibed there were beneficial to me for the rest of my life. Mm. Uh, and, and so uh, were, you, were you sort of uh, raised in kind of an urban setting, rural? Uh, we were country people, mm. and we were all either farmers or veterinarians. And my father and my grandfather were veterinarians. Oh, and I was supposed to be, one, but it didn't work out that way. <laughs> More the better for us. Um, so um, <clears throat> and now in terms of uh, attending school and, 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 and sort of university, did you stay in Nebraska? Um, my father began to develop health problems uh, working in the barns right. and he had very severe allergies and it was recommended that he leave the practice because uh, his health would be affected by it. My grandfather, who had helped to establish the vet school at the University of Missouri, was invited to the University of Georgia to help establish their vet school. And he said that there was no need to do that you know, that his son could stand in for him. So the University of Georgia contacted my father, and given his health situation, he decided to go to Athens, Georgia, to the University of Georgia, and to teach veterinary medicine. So that was an absolutely major shift in our lives. We left the Middle West, and we, live, we left a culture in which for better or for worse all all people were white right huh. uh, 
were a few First Nations, but they were very few. And I remember going to California uh, in Nebraska. The great vacation was to go to Colorado. Mm -hmm. And if you were really lucky, you crossed the Rockies and went all the way to Colorado, I mean, to California. Mm. And I remember coming to San Francisco probably in something like 1955 and seeing a black man sitting on a dock and I had to walk out to look at him, but I didn't want to be impolite because I knew you're not supposed to stare at people, but I had never seen a black man in my life. <laughs> and so we left Nebraska and we went to the South and the South was a whole different world. It was of course the segregated South and the South wouldn't begin to be desegregated until I left it, which was when I was in 10th grade. So I went there in fourth grade and stayed there till 10th grade. And uh, the South very much uh, lived in the uh, memory of the Civil War, which they called the War Between the States. In fact, the first day I went to school in Athens, Georgia, my wonderful mother, she told me that when you go to school, the boys are going to come up to you and ask you where you came from. Huh. And they're going to want to know if your state was a Yankee state or a Confederate state. So she says, you tell them that Nebraska was a territory and you'll have lots of friends. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened. I went to school and the white boys got around me. And they asked me where I came from, and I said, Nebraska. And they said, was that a Yankee state? And I said, no, it was a territory. And so then I was allowed to go out and play baseball, and uh, <laughs> it was fun. Right. Wow. Yeah, it's <clears throat> in, in, in being from the South, I, I can certainly attest to, uh, like you said, the, living in the memory of the, uh, the great war between the states. And um, in fact... Uh, in Athens, Georgia, uh, there were still ruins of the right. old uh, mansions that had been burned down uh, by Sherman. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the war was still there. And the South was very different in those days. It, it wasn't the new South that would begin to develop economically um, in, in later decades. It was a very different part of the world. I think also in my own psychological and spiritual development, spiritual development, that that was something very important because I was dislodged from one world and put into another mm -hmm. and uh, had to shift a lot of gears. Yeah. And uh, I think that that was all part of a broadening experience, which ultimately made me uh, sympathetic with a lot of things that uh, were not in my past. Right. Had you not been exposed to those things. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then again, you know, it being from the South, you know, uh, more often than not, the second or third question is what church, you know, which church do you go to? So, so yeah. tell us a little bit perhaps so, about the religious uh, background. My family was a Christian family mm -hmm. and um, Protestant. It was, we had Catholics in our family on my mother's father's side, but they kept that really quiet. And because uh, Catholicism in those days was very unpopular among Protestants. And most Americans, most white Americans in those days were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Um, that was a country in which you had white, black, a few Native Americans, and a few Mexicans that you would meet out in the West and the Southwest. Mm. But... Um, our family was a Calvinist family and a Lutheran family. My father's father's family were Lutheran. They were Swiss Lutherans. Um, my mother's maternal family was a very uh, Calvinist family. So we would go between Calvinist churches and between uh, the Lutheran church. However, as I approached maturity we became very attached to the Lutheran church because there in Athens, Georgia, the pastor of that church was a very 
an affable person, a very good speaker, very dynamic. And so we attached to him. And then as I um, approached my 12th birthday, I took the catechism from him. And I memorized Luther's shorter catechism, word by word, and I understood what it meant. He taught me weekly, uh, along with other children. And you know, then I was confirmed in the Lutheran Church when I was about 12 years old. Hmm. Uh, I mean, maybe for the sake of the, the listening audience, um, could you tell us maybe a little bit about the sort of the different ethos between the sort of Calvinist tradition and the Lutheran tradition? In, in, in Protestant Christianity? Um, well, um, that's a long discussion. I think in those, <laughs> days, uh, in those days, I mean, uh, the Calvinists have a different effect on history. Hmm. It's very, very important. Uh, and it's very important to things like the rise of modernism. Right. And, you know, the notion of the disciplinary Christian self. So in Calvinism, that's a really big thing, the, the discipline that is there. Uh, Lutheranism doesn't lack that completely, but it doesn't have it to the same degree. And one of the reasons why I personally was attracted to the Lutheran Church was that it was more symbolic and it was more beautiful. Mm. And I actually served as an acolyte, and I had to put on special clothes and I would also sing in the choir. And that sort of uh, more traditional aspect of the Lutheran Church was something that attracted me. Whereas the Calvinist churches were very stark mm. and um, not symbolic. <laughs> At least that element wasn't as prominent as it was in the Lutheran Church. I took my confirmation. I used to sit in the back of the church with my father, who was... Um, professor in veterinary medicine, and he also got a second PhD when he went to Georgia, which was in biochemistry, which was his real love. He loved chemistry, and he especially loved biochemistry. And uh, my father was a person that I loved very much. He had a huge influence on me, as did my mother. My mother was in English literature. And um, so I would sit in the back because I was an acolyte, and when the service would be over. I had to go to the front and go to the altar, enter by the side door, and then put out the candles. So my father would sit with me in the very back. And one beautiful spring day, not long after I was confirmed in the church, meaning I became a church member and I had all the rights and duties of a church member. Um, my father was walking with me. Uh, it was a beautiful day. And he turned to me and asked me if I truly believed in the Trinity. And that was a question that left me speechless. No doubt because I had a very strong relationship with my father and I trusted his intellect and I learned from him. And the very fact that he asked the question indicated to me that he didn't believe in it. Right. Or in any case that it was open to doubt. Right. And I couldn't answer. I couldn't say anything. And after a while, he told me a story of a missionary who went to China and tried to convert a sage and to convince the sage that three and one uh, were not a contradiction. So that story... Um, really affected me, and especially because my father told it to me. And I had a strong relationship with my pastor. So I went to him probably the same week and told him something to the effect that I have doubts about the Trinity. And uh, he wasn't able to remove those doubts. And in fact, his approach was one that I rebelled from because mm -hmm. he told me that St. Paul had said that if you drink the communion, the Lord's Supper, without belief in the Trinity, you drink damnation 
into your heart. And that's very frightening, but Paul didn't say that. Paul said, if you drink it without belief. Mm. And of course, he's understanding belief as belief in the Trinity, but the verse doesn't have any reference to that. And then he told me some other things. And so the result of that was that I was actually repelled. Right. And then over the next four years, I began to drift away. And by the time that I was 16, I didn't believe anymore. In fact, I became an atheist, and I didn't remain very comfortable with that for very long, maybe for a year, maybe a little bit longer. And then the process began of trying to find my way back. Mm. And one of the first steps in that was history. I went to the University of Missouri. I had never... Um, my father, by this time, by the way, was teaching at the University of Missouri, and my mother was too. And um, so you moved to Columbia. So we had moved to Columbia, Columbia Missouri. Missouri. Right. And um, so the head of the department taught us the introductory world history or world civilization class. And uh, I really fell in love with that professor. He was so good and so insightful, and he made history make sense. But one of the things that he said to me that was a revelation, what well, well, he said to the whole class was that Jesus Christ would not have been a Trinitarian, hmm. which was a pretty wow. rough thing to say in Missouri. Right. But that's what he said. And he said that, you know, the Trinity developed over stages in history. Jesus Christ was a Jew who was sent to the Jews. The Jews don't believe in anything like Trinity. So therefore, Jesus Christ would have believed in the oneness of God. Mm. Well, that was really medicine to my soul and music to my ears. And that begins a process of finding my way back to God. Um, I took a class in early modern philosophy. Again, I had really good professors, and uh, I can never thank the University of Missouri enough for the tremendous good they did to me, professors who really cared about students. Mm. But this professor was a prof professor who was really good in Greek philosophy, and uh, he would read the books, Descartes, Leibniz, uh, Spinoza, Hume, uh, Locke, mm -hmm. and other works, and he would read them to us, and it's like, you can get this. You can follow these words. It's not magic. Right. You can actually learn to think like this. And because so many of the early modern philosophers emphasized the necessary oneness of God, then that also struck me mm -hmm. that God is one and one is God. And I had, in fact, what I regarded to be a spiritual experience in which I resolved that God was one and that he must be one. And then also I studied English literature, which I love very much. I had dual majors in history and in English literature. And I love Shakespeare, but I also love John Milton. Mm. I didn't like modern literature. I, I liked medieval, uh, old English, medieval Renaissance. But John Milton, I really loved. And here again, I had one of the best professors I ever had. And he taught us how to read Milton. And he enabled us to envision the movement of the poetry. And I would spend sometimes most of the night reading Milton. And um, I read everything that he wrote. But what really stuck in my mind was how beautiful it must have been to believe like that. And if only I could believe like that, but I felt I can't do that because this is most, mostly mythological. Mm. There's so much mythological content in it. And then also there is the issue of the authenticity of the scripture, which is very important. Right. So that was the state that I was in. And I went to Cornell University. I got a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship. Um, and I went there in 1969. And... Um, there, I had to take a class in African-American literature. Right. 
That was one of the requirements, which I was very happy to do. And again, I had grown up in the South, and although we didn't mix with blacks, and we couldn't mix with blacks, that's just the segregated South was that way. Uh, Athens, Georgia must have been 40% black, but you never saw them on the streets. You never mixed with them ever. Uh, but, you know, you'd see them, mm-hmm. and you'd see them farming, and you'd see them doing uh, the, the tasks that they did in society. And so I took the black literature class, and because it wasn't my major, I wanted to get ahead and read those books before the semester started so that I could focus on my own uh, concentration during the semester. And so I began with W.E.B. Du Bois, The Soul of Black, Souls of Black Folks, which really was an illumination to me because this explained the South that I had grown up in. Mm-hmm. Uh, I then read a book which was called Cain, C-A-N-E, by Toomer, who is part of the Harlem Renaissance, which is a beautiful book. And it just reminded me of the South. I really loved the South. And I love the nature of the South. I used to go hiking or camping uh, every month, at least once. And he talked about the pine trees and the wind blowing through the pine trees. Mm -hmm. And it was a beautiful, enchanting book. And then I read another book, which might have been Native Son, but it was, I don't remember that book so well. And I probably didn't read that book thoroughly. I probably just read in it. And then I skipped to the autobiography of Malcolm X. Okay. I believe that was January the 1st, 1970. And I read that book all afternoon, all night. I could not put it down. And it just grabbed me. First of all, little personal touches like the fact that Malcolm was from Nebraska. And I was from Nebraska. And the Ku Klux Klan of Nebraska burned down his house in Omaha. So it's like, okay, well, this is pretty dramatic. And maybe I didn't even know there was a Ku Klux Klan in Nebraska. I didn't imagine things like that. And then he goes to Michigan, and I have family roots in Michigan as well. So those things all make this personal to me in a way that some people might not understand. Hmm. But uh, Malcolm's father was killed, of course, in East Lansing. And so the book held me, and, um, you know, Uh, It hooked me. That's just, I couldn't put it down. I read it all night long, and then by about 7 a.m., the sun had come up, and I had finished the chapter on pilgrimage. And I went to the window, I opened my curtain, I had an apartment that looked out over Lake Cayuga, and um, upstate New York, upstate New York, Ithaca, Ithaca, Cornell, and I sat down in my chair, It's a beautiful day, new snow everywhere. And um, I just asked myself, what did you learn from this book? And I answered, you learned that Allah and God are the same. Uh, If you'd asked me that question on an examination, I would have surely gotten it right. But in my heart, it didn't exist. In my heart, I had been brought up in the Christian church to believe that Muslims worshipped that Muslims worshipped another god, Allah, that was sort of like Baal of the ancient Phoenicians. And so I, I got it that now Allah and God are the same, and that Allah, God, guided Malcolm X. And that's all it took. Basically, I was in Islam from that time on. I came in with uh, amazing conviction, and then I just begin to study, and one thing follows another. So, it, just so I, I don't want to like step too far back, but but just um, before reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, you're you're obviously I mean this is the late sixties, the nineteen sixties, early seventies, surely the civil rights movement, and that's at the backdrop of all of this. How are you responding to that, if anything? Uh, so the nineteen sixties for people like me was, first of all, uh, the era of the anti-war movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what counted to me first. Right. And then the civil rights movement um, begins to be strong. 
in that. And so in my case, um, my opposition to the war in Vietnam, which had a lot to do with the things I was taught at the University of Missouri and the insights I had to what was really going on there and the nature of the military industrial complex, which President Eisenhower had warned us against. Mm -hmm. So I was one of those millions of young people who was very concerned with stopping the war and not supporting the war. And um, that led, unfortunately, to a rupture between me and my family. My family were very conservative and they were Republican and they were right wing. And so therefore my position um, was one that I'm very sorry to say alienated me from my grandfather and, you know, from my uh, father and my mother. And that was painful for them and painful for me. And it's painful, painful for me even to think back on it. But I became a leftist. Um, maybe one of the reasons is because my family was very right wing. And so I sort of bounced the other way and I became a very left wing and uh, very concerned with stopping the military industrial complex, which may sound like an absurd uh, desire, but that's what we talked about. That's what we, um, me and my friends, we were concerned with, um, to be very frank, although I had tremendous respect for Dr. King, and I was riveted by his speeches. Um, it was the black power movement that really got me. Mm -hmm. And when uh, H. Rap Brown began to talk about black power, then I felt that I understand what that means and that this is the way to do it. If you want your rights, you've got to be able to stand up for them mm -hmm. and you've got to be able to take them. Um, I had friends that were also uh, connected you know, to the Black Power movement. And um, I, I really felt that Black Power was so therapeutic. I don't know if the listener uh, would understand that or sympathize with that. Some, of course, will, some won't. But uh, the thing is, is that I really felt that emphasis on the beauty of Black people Mm. and the integrity of black people and the assertion you know of their humanity in this way was really good i was so that's what made me happy and of course in the 1960s that also becomes one of the dominant themes that black is beautiful and i agree that black is beautiful and um there was also muhammad ali uh there was uh james brown right. And a lot of things that were going on that were really changing the way that people looked at things. I did have respect for Malcolm X, but it was essentially as a socialist. Mm. And it wasn't until I went to Cornell that I discovered that he had this religious dimension of Islam, which was not clear to me before that, although I knew that he had been in the nation of Islam. And, um, and you knew of the nation of Islam? Uh, not very much, not, not very much. Not very much. I remember when it was broadcast across the United States and, uh, you know, the hate that hate bred, was that the name of that program? Yeah. And things like that. Right. But again, I found the nation of Islam very interesting. Right. And interestingly enough, uh, my last year at the University of Missouri, I took a class in the history of the Old South. Okay. Again, with a really good teacher. And my paper that I wrote for that class was on the African roots of the slaves. Okay. And I did a pretty good job with that. And I wrote about the kingdom of Mali, Songhai. Right. And I wrote about um, uh, Islam and how rational it was. And, uh, you know, but again, it, it, it didn't attract me as a personal choice. In fact, in those days, I used to read a magazine in French, which was called Jeune Afrique, 
Young Africa, which was a French socialist journal. And I liked it a lot. And it had in it articles about Islam also, because one of the objectives of Jeune Afrique was to convince its readers, especially African readers, that there was complete compatibility between Islam and socialism. Mm. And so um, I often would read, artic- would read articles and just be amazed about how rational, how reasonable Islam was. I remember reading the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, and just wondering, how do you pronounce that? It must be beautiful. It's alliterated. Yeah, you're right. But uh, in any case, it was Malcolm that brought me into the faith. And no doubt the strength of his incredible personality as reflected in his book and his life work. So do you formally embrace the faith when you say brought you to Islam? Now, do you... Uh, well, when I say that it brought me to yeah. Islam, it means that I had no doubts about it. And, the um, truth of the... Yeah. But I didn't know that you have to embrace the faith, and I didn't know any Muslims. That's right. And, in fact, I had a Syrian friend whose name was Adnan from Damascus, whom I had met before I became a Muslim, and he knew I liked languages. Okay. And so he had promised me that if you ever want to learn Arabic, I would love to teach you. And so at the same time that I'm entering Islam, I also asked Adnan to come to my house once a week and to teach me Arabic. I began with Arabic, but I never told him I was a Muslim. And I didn't know that I could, and I didn't know that I would be accepted if I did. And But I, I was reading the Qur'an. I was believing in it. I memorized Al-Fatiha in English. And I remember I would stand on those beautiful hills at Cornell and recite it facing towards the West, which is not the Qibla, but, you know, just having these yeah. incredible spiritual experiences as I recited Al-Fatiha in English. And Ayat al-Kursi was just, to me, beyond words. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, and this is something that Cat Stevens, Yusuf Islam, has talked about, that, you know, we do get something out of the English translation. You know, like, do you understand that? That it's not just um, sort of some kind of marginal thing, that you can actually get some guidance out of that. So, um, you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, I didn't really know what it meant to become a Muslim, but, you know, I did believe. And I remember that I had a... Tunisian in one of my seminars at Cornell. And I thought he was French because he's always speaking French Mm -hmm. and he's always got Le Monde. And and so one night my first wife and I went out to go skiing. We'd go skiing maybe once a week. And uh, he was there at the ski lodge. And I asked him his name and I expected to be Jacques or Pierre or something like that. And he said, Mahmoud. And I'd never heard the name Mahmoud. So I said, Muhammad. And he said, no, Mahmoud. And three times I said, Muhammad. And he said, no, Mahmoud. And then (laughs) I got it. But then as I took, uh, you know, the ski lift up to the top of the mountain, I told myself that you love the name Muhammad, don't you? Uh Because the fact that you thought his name was Muhammad changed everything about him in your eyes. Wow. But then um, my draft board was breathing down my neck. They didn't like me very much. (laughs) And um, they were going to order me for induction. And therefore, I decided that I would make an Islamic conscientious objection to the war. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I needed to have knowledge about Islam. Mm-hmm. So, Brother Adnan, this would have been in April, about four months later, um, he came to teach me the Arabic lesson, and I said, like, I have to tell you something very personal. And this is in my room, right, in my living room, but so let's go over to the corner. I don't know who's going to hear it, you know, right. but I took him over the corner, and I just told him, I've become a Muslim. Of course, he was beyond himself in joy. I didn't really know because like the black Muslims, they didn't seem to welcome white people. And like, I don't know how other Muslims feel about that. 
But, uh, and I told him, I have to tell you that because I need to make an Islamic statement of conscientious objection to the war in Vietnam and to induction. Mm -hmm. So he said, I've got just the man for you right tonight. And this is Sharif Amr Hassan, who was teaching, he was an Egyptian teaching law at, uh, he was he was from Columbia University and teaching at Cornell. And so we went to his house and he was actually working on that very topic. And he gave me books and he said, you read these books and read these passages and then you write your objection. Maybe I can defend you in court mm. if it comes to that. In the end, uh, someone else defended me, but... Um, you know, and then of course the word got out to the Muslim students at Cornell that I was a Muslim. They were about 100 okay. and they're all from all over the world. And we had about four or five for Jomar. But, um, this Kuwaiti, Abdul Aziz al Fulaj, may Allah bless him, he brought me all the Islamic books they had, which was a stack, you know, about maybe three feet tall. Yeah. And, um, most of them you could speed read. And uh, I had read all their books in probably two weeks, and I became the imam, basically. Uh, I've become now the most knowledgeable, and they've got me giving khutbahs and doing other things. But, um, you know, so it was really this uh, need to respond to the draft right. that brought me into the public sphere. And then people like Adnan, uh, God bless him, he told me, you know, everything in the Qur'an you read, you've got to do. Mm -hmm. So you can't eat pork, you can't drink wine, and you do have to make salat. Well, that might sound like something that doesn't need to be said, a, a duh moment, as they say today. <laughs> uh, for Christians, uh, it wasn't, because we tend to look at the biblical tradition as something that pertained to them, right. but not necessarily to us. This was part of our Christian mentality. And so therefore, it's like these commands are for another people mm -hmm. in another time. But then when he said that, no, you've got to actually do all of this, then it made sense. And so then we got rid of the wine and we stopped buying pork and I learned how to make salat. I got a little handbook and and uh, then I then I really come into the dean as, you know, you would, in a way that's recognizable, you know, right. to other Muslims. Right, right. Um, and then, you, so you're still at Cornell. Um, what's the, uh, is, is, is University of Chicago next? Well, and, and uh, so what happens then is that um, the anti-war movement, I, I went to Missouri I presented my case. I was interviewed by a lawyer appointed by the draft board, mm -hmm. and they then ordered me for induction. And so the draft movement, the anti-draft movement, they directed me, they counseled me to refuse induction in Philadelphia, and they facilitated my doing that. And so I refused induction in Philadelphia, the idea was that Philadelphia was a liberal city mm. and there were a lot of people refusing the draft there and that it would probably take years before my case would come to court okay. and perhaps the war would be over. Uh, interesting when I, interestingly, when I refused induction, I walked out of the building in downtown Philadelphia, I was walking back to the house that I was staying at, and I actually ran into Muhammad Ali. The only time in my life. Wow. And I actually stopped and talked with him for a little bit. Right. And at the end of that, I told him I was a Muslim, and he gave me salams. It was an amazing thing. Unfortunately, <laughs> I never had the honor to meet him again. Right. Now, by this time, he's already had his... Uh, he had refused, he had refused it as well. Yeah. And God, uh, he was still first. in the Nation of Islam, right. and I, in my own way tried to urge him to follow the way of Malcolm X and to leave the nation of Islam. Mm. Uh, being, trying to not be too close so that I wouldn't get punched, <laughs> right? Because he's a big, powerful man, you know, but uh, I did talk to him about that a little bit. Wow. And, and in any case, he was very respectful of me. Right. God bless him. He's a beautiful person. Mm. Um, I come back to Cornell and Nixon who was the president, changed the draft law so that no matter 
where you refused induction, you would be prosecuted in your home state. Mm. Well, my home state at that time was Missouri, Missouri, and I would be taken to court in central Missouri, which is very conservative. Yes. So my draft board ordered me for an induction a second time. Okay. And this time I just decided to go to St. Louis and to refuse there. So I refused a second time. Um, and then after that, there were different things that had to be done, legal matters. Right. I had a lawyer in Columbia. Um, in, at, toward the end of winter in 1972, I got a letter, and I thought basically this was the beginning to go to federal penitentiary, because mm -hmm. that's usually what happened. I couldn't understand what the letter said, so I took it to my lawyer, and she said, give me a day or two on this. And then she called me back, and she said, you won't believe it, but you have been pardoned. Mm -hmm. And that the, 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 the prosecutor, not persecutor, the prosecutor <laughs> in... Uh, Missouri right. had decided that the draft board had violated my legal rights on two serious accounts. One that they had actually opened my case when they called me for that interview. And therefore, once they open it, they can't close it again without considering it on its merits. Mm. And they didn't do that. And then they had called me for induction a second time simply to get me in prison right. you know, so that I would be prosecuted in Missouri and mm -hmm. not in Pennsylvania. And so they said, we're going to throw this out. Right. And amazingly then uh, I could apply for graduate school. Right. I got accepted at the University of Chicago with a fellowship. And then when summer ended, I was in Chicago getting ready to go to the University of Chicago, and I was able to then pursue that program and to get a PhD in Arabic and Islamic studies. I had decided after becoming a Muslim that that's what I wanted to do, that right. although I loved English literature and I loved history, that uh, I would love to devote my life to a really sound knowledge of the Arabic language and uh, Islam. Mm. And at that time, was University of Chicago the place to go to study that? Uh, at, at that time, well, or one the of, University of Chicago, uh, Princeton, Harvard, okay. Columbia, um, Berkeley. Okay. You know, there were a number of schools that you could go to, also McGill. And I probably applied to most of those, if not all of those, but the University of Chicago gave me a really beautiful offer. Mm. And um, then I also had an affinity with Chicago, being a Middle Western city. Right. And as a boy, my father had been called up from Nebraska in the Korean War. And so we had spent some time in Chicago when he was called up. And that was just a beautiful time of my childhood. My mother would take me to the Museum of Science and Technology, to the Field Museum, to the Aquarium. We would walk along the lake. We lived in Hyde Park. And uh, I just really loved Chicago as a little boy. Mm. And so I had good memories of the city. In fact, my experiences in Chicago have always been really good. Right. So you had memories even of Hyde Park in particular, where, of mm. course, you would come back for the University of Chicago. That's right. Right. <laughs> sure and so when, when you're there, obviously, at that time, uh, Professor uh, Fazal Rahman, so you know, right. Fazal Rahman, yeah. may God oh, yeah. have mercy on him, yeah. he was my advisor. Oh, okay. And uh, he was extremely kind and extremely intelligent. And I fundamentally disagreed with him on things like hadith. And I believed in the authenticity of hadith narration. And we had at the University of Chicago uh, Nabia Abbott, who may have been a Muslim when she died. She was an Arab Christian, and she has a book called Studies in Arabic Literary Papyri that really, really affected me. It is one of the classical studies of Hadith literature and other early literature, and it really establishes the integrity of Hadith transmission. Also, Fuad Sezgin's book, 
which is called Geschichte des Arabischen Schrifttums, A History of Arabic Writing. That was a, a relatively new book at that time, and we were told that it was one of the greatest academic works of the 20th century. Mm. And, um, you know, I was very much influenced by Fuad Sezgin's work also, and especially his treatment of Hadith, in which he has a very interesting approach based on Isnad. Mm. So that's what I wanted to do. But Fazl Rahman, he never told me no, but he very subtly manipulated me and pushed me uh, to study law. And he made me fall in love with it. And then uh, out of that ultimately would come my dissertation topic, which was on the origins of Islamic law, Malik's concept of Amal, which Fazl Rahman really was happy with. Mm. And uh, so were the other professors, some of them uh, a little bit rigorous. Okay. I mean, like Madelung, he was extremely rigorous and basically made me rewrite the whole first draft. Mm. But that was good for me. Okay. And so what were your, I mean, you know, we've talked on the show, I mean, again, not specifically, but sort of tangentially, we've had Professor Ibrahim Musa on the show who shares his experiences uh, with, with, with Dr. Rahman. Um, what, what are sort of your, you know, just your, your impressions of him at the time? I mean, you talked a little bit about already the fact that you disagreed with him about Hadith, mm-hmm. but in terms of his scholarship or, uh, his relationship to the community at the time in Chicago. How was that? He lived in Naperville. That's where I live right now. And he lived not too far from here. Wow. Um, Naperville was still quite small in those days. Um, I would come out to visit him from time to time, you know, to get to know his family. And he wanted me to do that. So he wanted me to be close to his children in particular. Um, he would sit on the floor. He had his library in the basement of his house and he had a nice carpet and he would sit cross-legged on the carpet. And that's how he would do all of his work. Wow. And he had an amazing knowledge of Arabic, an amazing knowledge of Persian and of probably Latin and Greek and certainly of English. He had, he was competent in French and German uh, he he knew, of course, Urdu, Urdu. and Punjabi. Yeah. And um, he was an extremely humble man, mm. a very unimposing man. Um, he uh, was just fun to study with. And the main thing that I did was uh, to read books with him, to read texts in Arabic with him. And um, he was as excited as I was. And um, so my experience with him was never a dull moment and never a moment I regret. Mm. Um, you know, he, he was very good for me. And I would never correct him. I wouldn't tell him that I disagree with you. That's just not my nature. But then my dissertation is essentially an attempt to show him right. that hadith have integrity. Yes. And um, as I said, he really liked the dissertation. Um, now, was it your interest in hadith literature uh, that specifically drew you to study Malik and mm-hmm. the, the Medellin school? Well, in 1974 or 1975, I organized a conference at the Illinois Institute of Technology on the south side of Chicago to celebrate the 1,000th anniversary of Imam al-Bukhari's passing. And um, it was, you wouldn't believe it, but I did a pretty good job. Uh, People know that I'm not good at organization, but in those days I was a little bit better. (laughs) And... um, we organized it. Of course, I wasn't the only one. Right. But we organized a really nice conference. And I and it was all about hadith. Right. And I did so much work in that. And I produced things um, about the muhaddiths and their biographies. And we brought um, a sheikh from India whose name was Fazl Rahman also. He's called Fazl Rahman Gunori. Yeah. Gunori. And he was from Aligarh. 
And we brought Mustafa Aadami, who became one of my best friends and mentors. And we brought also Sheikh Abdullah Al Mubarak from King Abdul Aziz University, who was a Syrian. Okay. Uh, he would pass, and ironically, I would be the one when I went to King Abdul Aziz to take his position, which was uh, to teach comparative religion. And we had other scholars as well. And so I really loved the Sheikh. Um, Fazl Rahman Gunori. Mm. He was a Hakim and he was a traditional Sheikh and he knew Persian perfectly. I had studied Persian at the University of Chicago and I also was allowed to study Urdu. So Fazl Rahman allowed me to make Urdu my Islamic language because you had to have two, uh, two Islamic languages, Arabic. Arabic, Persian or Turkish. But I said that I studied Persian, uh -huh. but I want Urdu. And so I was able to do that. And at those, in those days, I knew Urdu well enough to speak. In fact, I gave an interview in Urdu in Toronto on the radio. We can do wow. this in Urdu, right? Is that key? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I used it for no, no. years. You, you would still school us, but, believe me. <laughs> um, but, you know, Fazal Man uh, Ganori spoke beautiful Urdu, incredible Urdu. It was just like pearls dropping from heaven. And he stayed on after the conference okay. for um, maybe two weeks. And uh, so I gave him all my graduate papers uh -huh. and said, please give me your assessment. So I had written many graduate papers and he liked them all, okay. but not one of them. One of them was a paper I wrote on the great book, which is in Malik and Medina. And it is also very central to my dissertation called Ikhtilafu Malik wa Shafi'i. Oh. It is the descent that is between Malik and a Shafi'i. Yeah. And this really important early text, which Fazl Rahman had had me reading, uh, I took a Shafi'i point of view okay. in it. And so he told me that that's what you've done. He said, you've just taken the protagonist's point of view. But what you don't understand is that the Malikis have their own usul, their own methodology, just, their right. own methodology, just right. as the Hanafis do. That's right. So he said that what I want you to do is to go to your library, get any contemporary contemporary Arab book in usul al fiqh, uh, read it, and then I want you to read in Bidayat al Mujtahid of Ibn Rushd, and I want you to read in Ashatibi al Muwafaqat. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, a Turkish professor who was at the University of Chicago at that time advised me to read in Al Qarafi as oh, well. Okay. So I did that. I read, I got a book by Zaki Sha'ban on Usul al Fiqh, which I thought was the best. And it was good. And it changed everything because it's like now I saw that this law makes sense and it can be applied to every culture and every time and place. Right. And that um, custom, good custom matters. Al-Adam Muhakkama. That's right. So this was, but then I learned many other things. Then I began to read in Bidayat and Mujtahid. And early on in that, I encountered a case where both Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with him, and Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, had not followed the apparent meaning of a hadith that they regarded to be authentic. Right. And so he says that Malik follows amal in this. Mm. Uh, he follows the practice of the people of Medina. Right. And for Abu Hanifa, it pertains to Umum al-Balwa. Well, Umum al-Balwa is something I knew what it meant now because I had read Usul al-Fiqh. Right. And this is matters of public necessity, you know, so they should be well known by everyone. They shouldn't be simply transmitted by an isolated hadith, even if it's authentic, if everybody didn't know that in practice. And Ibn Rush said, here Imam Malik's use of Amal is cognate to Abu Hanifa's use of Umum al-Balwa. That was it. Right. It's like, okay, because practice is a big deal yes. with the Orientalists. So I said, that will be my dissertation. Right. And now we will show that amal is a legal category and that it is a methodological category. Mm -hmm. And of course, I will discover how much it was. 
much more so than I imagined at that time. Right. But immediately I took that topic to Fazl Rahman and he was delighted. And we wrote it up and that became my dissertation topic. And then, you know, the rest is just really hard work, right. uh, you know, for the next three years until the dissertation was completed in 1978. But that's how that came about. Right. And uh, again, Fazl Rahman, his role in that was really just that he focused me on these tracts that are in the last volume of Kitab al-Um of Imam al-Shafi'i, which are historical legal tracts of the greatest importance. Mm -hmm. um, and so, mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much to talk mm -hmm. about. And, you know, we could spend a lot just talking about mm -hmm. uh, each period, it almost seems. Um, but now uh, you, you've, you've uh, completed your dissertation, you've defended it. And now you take a you take a job teaching somewhere. So um, I taught before the PhD in Temple. Okay. And that was actually just an intensive course, and it was just for the summer. So it wasn't very long, but it was a lot of work, and it enabled me also to break out of the confines of dissertation study. Mm -hmm. So this was an intensive course on all of Islam and Islamic intellectual history. And so it enabled me to study things that I had had only a smattering of as a graduate student. But now it's like, you're going to teach this so you can really read lots of things. Right. So that was a, a, a big breath of fresh air. Then I went to Temple. Dr. Faruqi was there. God have mercy on him. And he also was very good to me. Okay. And he loved me. And so I went to Temple and I taught at Temple for a year. I met Dr. Jackson. I was uh, when saying. I was there, and Dr. Jackson was a new Muslim. Right. I was going to bring up the fact that on, on the episode where we had Dr. Jackson, um, he mentions going to the Islamic Center of Philadelphia mm -hmm. on Broad Street. That's right. And hearing that, you that, for that. the first time. Yeah. He said, <laughs> wow. he mentioned that on the show. Yeah. And at that time, yeah. of course, Dr. Mm -hmm. Jackson was at Temple transitioning into the University of Pennsylvania, but studying with uh, the late Ismail Farouki. Mm -hmm. All right. And, so you were faculty uh, there for one year. Yeah, and I remember Dr. Jackson very clearly standing in the back of my class and sort of <laughs> looking at me with his head tilted to the side <laughs> and probably with his his hand on his chin or something like that. And, you know, he was very impressive, very intelligent. And then also we met later when I went to Jeddah yes. and he was working on his PhD. Right. But uh, when I was at Temple, then uh, Which, Michigan contacted it, it, me. Interestingly enough, would also revolve around the Maliki school, right? I mean, he uh, specializes in Qarafi. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, in any case, um, I was at Temple, right. and Michigan okay. called me up, and they said, you've got a job here if you get your Ph.D. <sighs> so that was at the end of 1977. And therefore, beginning 1978, January 1978, I just decided that I'm going to, I had to rewrite the whole first draft because Madelung, uh really took it apart. And that was good that he did that. Mm -hmm. Madelung was extremely rigorous. And it's like, you don't say anything you don't prove. And, and so I saw that, like, you be really careful how you write this. Do not overstate anything. Understate everything and prove it. Mm. And so I said, I'm going to, you know, we didn't have computers. I had a typewriter. I could type quite well. And I said, I'm not going to retype a single page. Okay. I'm just going to type this thing through and finish it. And Allah gave me great help. And by the time that I was going to Michigan in the early summer, everything was finished, but one chapter, I was able to finish that chapter in Michigan and then in September Ramadan of 1978, uh, I was able to defend my dissertation and to get the PhD, alhamdulillah. Right. And then get the job at Michigan. And, and I, ha I was at Michigan, right. but, you know, then I could keep the job keep at Michigan. Job. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you also taught mm -hmm. for a stint at uh, the University of Windsor? Well, that, that's that summer okay. class. Got it. So that was in Canada. That was that Windsor. Right, right. Across and the bridge. that was uh, <laughs> extremely intensive. Right. Um, it was a short time, but you know, again, it was very beneficial because it enabled me to disengage my mind with the dissertation, mm. you know, which um, was very necessary so I could come back to it, 
with a fresh point of view. Right. So, I mean, I, and I know sort of what's coming up. So, and, and that, which is why I asked this question, um, what's happening in terms of your own sort of spiritual inquiry and, and where you are in the faith and, and, and cause I know soon enough mm-hmm. now it, you leave Western academia to go overseas. Mm-hmm. So, so what's some of the impetus? I was at like? Michigan for four years. Okay. And during that time I did write a book called the Islamic struggle in Syria. Right. And, um, that book I wrote under the direction of Hamid Alger. He and I were close friends at that time. He was at Berkeley. He was at Berkeley. And we both felt that the Iranians needed to be shown that what Hafez al-Assad was doing in Syria was wrong and that they could not morally support that. Mm. Um, Perhaps my idea was very naive but uh, not understanding the geopolitics and other things that go on in these kind of decisions. But I wrote that book, and that book was published in 1984. I had left Michigan by that time. But that book sort of embodies the person that I had become by 1982. It was, you know, like so many Muslims uh, in our communities, the political aspect of Islam was very important. Right. Um, from the time that I became a Muslim and was introduced to the literature, this politicized Islam is the one that you're going to get. It's dominant. And uh, then, of course, going to the University of Chicago, beginning the study of traditional texts, this also had its own quite different effect. Right. But that put me into law and usul al-fiqh. Okay. And I respected the whole tradition of Islam. I didn't really know what that tradition was or how to discover it. And I didn't know much about theology. And I didn't know hardly anything about Sufism. And um, I had a good opinion of the Sufis. I wrote an article at Michigan on the word in Islam, W-O-R-D. Right. Uh, and in that, I come across a lot of really interesting things the Sufis say, and I really was fascinated by that. But the Sufis that I would meet in those early 12 years of my Islam, they usually were people who didn't impress me, mm. and often people who had no political convictions, any concern about oppression, mm. um, and also they were people who maybe had a very shaky tie to the Sharia. Mm -hmm. And the Sharia, the law to me, was everything. I loved the law. And I must say that I found the law intoxicating. And Usul I found intoxicating. So in 1980, at the end of 1981, my wife and I were invited to Qatar and I was invited to give a speech in English and in Arabic, uh, both of them on Islamic civilization. And um, there was a group of Spanish Muslims there. And um, they were Sufis and they were Durqawis. And I was with them for eight days. And they would ask me to come upstairs and to lead them in Salat as subh and then they would do their wird. Well, I'd never done a wird in my life. Right. Which is like a litany. I didn't even, for, for the those. litany, yeah, I didn't litany. know what it was, but, and I wouldn't do it because I didn't know if it was mubah or right. not. Right. Very legal. Uh, <laughs> Permissible. But I would listen to it. Right. And I thought, like, this is beautiful. And, you know, <laughs> these are also things you don't do. You don't do salat on the Prophet hardly at all, except if his name is mentioned. But they're doing it many times in a beautiful ways. And you knew Arabic, so you understood, you, you, you appreciated the beauty. I appreciated the beauty of it. And in those days, I was very close to Yusuf al-Qaradawi. And in fact, he's the one who had invited me to Qatar. And I had to go to Pakistan after that to Rawalpindi for a Sira conference. Okay. And this would be in the early part, January of 1982. And uh, so before I went, I just told him that you know, I'm attracted to these people. 
and uh, they have a word. Is it legitimate for me to recite that? And he said, it is. You asked uh, Yusuf Qardawi. Yeah, and I said also that they are influenced by Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. Okay. So he said, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> right. That was like a yellow flag for him. Yeah, maybe. but yeah. Uh, right. in any case, um, I went to Pakistan and um, I woke up there for Salat al-Fajr, the first day in Rawalpindi, and I had to recite the Wirda. I just couldn't not do it. Mm. And it was a beautiful experience. When I came back to Michigan, I uh, just got every book that I could find on the Darqawi way. Okay. And they had a lot, actually. Wow. And um, I read them with a diligence that surpassed my study for the PhD. Wow. And then by um, the end of, uh, by spring break, basically, um, I hope people don't imitate me in their lives, but um, I basically decided that I'm going to Spain. Right and that this is what I want to do. And we had a community in Spain and in England at that time yes. that was extremely effective in da'wah. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like this is what my heart wants to do. Right. I'm not really concerned with being a prima donna professor mm. in, a, in front of the class. Uh, I would rather really do this work. So I went to Spain, and that was a good time and a bad time. The best of all times and the worst of all times. (laughs) Great. But in the end, uh, the doors were opened for me in Morocco to meet real Sufis and real Darqawis. And that was an amazing thing. And then just doors begin opening after that. Um, I mean, there's a real history there, and I don't, I mean, if you, you know, we don't have to necessarily delve into it. We can gloss over or maybe touch on some of the highlights. I would say certainly this is, you meet a lot of, I know, Western Muslims at the time, mm-hmm. specifically Sheikh Hamza. Mm-hmm. This is in Spain. That's right. Right. Now That's he's, when I meet Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Allah bless him. Right. And he's obviously much younger, but mm-hmm. uh, you encounter him probably, what, right after he embraces Islam and he... No, he, he, he would was have Muslim. been a Muslim okay. by, at that time, probably for at least two years. Okay. But, Relatively. Uh, and he was extremely impressive. Okay. Of course, extremely charismatic. Even at that time. And uh, when I go to Granada, I'm going to teach there. Uh-huh. And um, so he brings me books and he talks to me. And, um, and, and you know, um, he was really good to me and to my family the whole time. And when things began to go bad, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf stood by us like a pillar. Mm. And, um, you know, I thank him forever for that. And our lives were sort of woven together. Uh, Began there in Spain. And I can remember the day we met. And then it will continue. And I will go to Jeddah where I teach for 16 years, and there I found the great masters of the Sufi path. In Jeddah of all places. In Jeddah of all places. And uh, that's because many people don't know that the Wahhabis in Saudi Arabia are probably not more, this is my impression, when I lived there, than 15%. Right. They are a minority. And they're not really very respected or very loved. They're harsh people, but there are a lot of really good people in Mecca, in Medina, in Jeddah, in Riyadh, in the eastern provinces. And I had the honor to be around real Mashayikh. Mm-hmm. Uh, my principal sheikh was from Eritrea. He was a refugee, very poor, very beautiful. Um, and then I was with uh, Habib Ahmed Mashur al-Haddad, yes. and I... Uh, also was with Abdul Qadir, Habib Abdul Qadir as saqaf and with many others. So this, these 16 years were extremely important for me because there I was able to get exposure to the practice of 
the spiritual path in a way that I believe was 100% authentic. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't believe that if any good has come from my life, that it would have been possible without that. Right. So, so your experiences, and we'll just leave it at that, in, in Spain hadn't necessarily turned you off from Sufism. I really went to Rit Spain Raj. to be a Sufi. Right, right. That's why, I, I mean, I wanted to do the other things, but then uh, when I got there, they had turned off the faucet. And uh, very we nice weren't way to put Sufis it. anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's a very nice way to put it. And um, so I was there, I... I I was commissioned to teach the Spanish Muslims Arabic in one year. I almost killed myself trying to do it. I, I worked really hard. Um, but then in the end, it was not the best of experiences. Right. But then when I went to Morocco, after the bitterness, uh, all the doors opened. Yeah. And um, sometimes in the path, it happens like that, that I, I went there to get the Darqawi way. And uh, then when I go to Morocco, they gave it to me. And I met great people there, truly great people. Do you meet um, um, Muley Hassan, who's the father-in-law of Osama Kanan? Um, Muley Hassan was, yeah. and his father were among those great people. Okay. And um, Sheikh Osama's wonderful wife was a little girl, and <laughs> she would bring me food, and she would... <laughs> Do other things, you know, to take care yeah. of me as a guest. And that house, in the, which is like a bed, it's a gate. They, they, they're home. Uh -huh. And, 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 and that home. room, which may be a mosque now or a musalla, right. that was actually the guest room. Yes. So I slept there. Right. And I could look out that little window, that medieval window, uh, and look at the square down below. Right. And I was there for about two weeks. Uh, Muli Hashim was also one of the great ones. Okay. And then Muli Hassan and Muli... Hashim took me to visit Sidi Muhammad al Qurashi in the desert, who was like the great one at that time. At that time. Yeah. And those days with him were extremely transformative and very powerful. And then after that, I go back to Spain. Um, we're not able to put things together. Uh, there's another sheikh who comes into the picture at that time, whose name is Sheikh Bashir. God have mercy on him. Um, he will come to visit me twice in Spain. He knows everybody. He's an Eritrean, but he lived in Medina. They would visit him in Medina. He was a healer. He was a man that you had to love if you knew him. So he tried to put us together, but he couldn't do it. Okay. And then after his second trip, he told me that um, you're going to have to leave. That's and he said, really you're leave. coming to me. And um, I didn't really want to leave. And I didn't. I loved him, but... I had no intention to go to Saudi Arabia. Okay. And he said, you know, he said, the community, you won't be able to put it back together. Mm. He said, it is now fragmented. It will be fragmented again and again and again. Everybody will be on their own, basically. Only a great sheikh could bring it back together. Mm. But he said, you're not that, and you won't be able to do that. And so he said, you're coming to me. And then he left. And in a short time, one of my beloved friends, Osman Llewellyn, who was in Mecca in those days, he works in environmental protection. And we are, he's an American Muslim. We right. were, I knew him since 1970. Okay. And so he came to me with his wife in Granada. And um, I took him around and showed him the beautiful mountains and other things. I loved Spain. Absolutely loved Spain. But um, he said, I have a letter here, and I want you to sign it, and you will have a job at King Abdul Aziz University. Wow. And so I signed it. And the next thing you know, in a few months, um, I'm in Jeddah. And I, I was received, I was treated royally. Okay. Uh, that's the truth. I mean, uh, everything went really beautifully. And then Sheikh Bashir, I meet with him. And uh, he is the one who introduces me to the man who will become my principal sheikh, okay. Sheikh Muhammad Abu Bakr, the Eritrean. Okay, right. And I will be with him for 19 years. I was in his company for 16. And then he died in 2004, 2003. And After you left. Um, yeah. And you also mentioned, I, I've heard you in the past mention 
uh, someone by the name of Dr. Khaldun. I think, right? Well, Dr. Khaldun al Ahdab was one of my colleagues okay. and one of my friends. At King al yes. yes, and he would be a teacher of outward knowledge. He was a muhaddith, okay. a man who loves the entire tradition and loves the Sufis, but he's not a, a Sufi right. shaykh. He would be a muhaddith. Right. Yeah. And he and I had the same office, and okay. we were colleagues, and then also uh, I learned a lot from him. And I wrote a book in Arabic called al iman fitra okay. which came out uh, in, I think, 2000, maybe 14. Uh, but I actually wrote it at that time in oh, Arabic, okay. and Habib Ali al-Jifri insisted that we publish it. Okay. So he did. But Sayyid Khaldun helped me with that a lot because he enabled me to get the hadith right Okay. that I use. Now that remains in the Arabic language. It's in the Arabic right, language. Right. And it's a, it's a book that um, people have spoken highly of. Okay. Um, For the sake of our listeners, mm-hmm. let me like, you translate that as the sort of primordial faith. Yeah, that, yeah. that um, you know, the, that belief in God is the primordial right. faith. Right. And, and so it also talks about what Islam says about <clears throat> the natural self, the primordial self, and then it also talks about um, things like so-called primitive religion, okay. and that primitive religion is always monotheistic. Mm. And there I rely very much on Wilhelm Schmidt, who was a great German anthropologist, and he was also a clergyman. Uh, he was a Catholic clergyman. But uh, Schmidt's study of primitive religion is really out of this world, mm. extremely detailed. And he shows that primitive people are never animist. They always believe in one God. Wow. And, the, and he's got facts there to show yeah. that to be the case. So I talk about that. I talk about uh, secular alternatives to religion. And um, I get into Egyptian religion. And then I got hired at the Noe Foundation and the computer was shut down and I got here and I can't write on it anymore. So the book was never finished. Okay. But Habib Ali said, even if it's not finished, we're going to publish it. So he did. Okay. And that was just last year. That was 2014. I think 2014. 2014. But my book that I had to teach from was written by Sheikh Abdurrahman Habannaka, who was a great Syrian scholar. And it was really good, and it had in it intellect, proofs of God based on intellect. So that's your book. You know, I didn't give it to you. And uh, the students loved that. Mm. And it's like it opened up their minds that you can look at the world around you and see that God is one. You can look at the world around you and know that God is perfect and that he has infinite knowledge and will and power. And so I actually enjoyed that tremendously. And the students, I think, also did as well. And I taught right. thousands of students when I was there. Right. And um, all in all, it was good. Uh, the, the last years were also bitter mm. uh, because of, you know, certain injustices that happened to my family. Yeah. But there's no need to go into that. That's right. um, in fact, uh, Sheikh Bashir had told me, when I first came in 1984, he said, these will be among the most beautiful years of your life. Mm. And you hold to these sheikhs. And the sheikhs also protect you so that you don't have any trouble with the society at large. And you can lead a sound Sunni traditional life. But he said that these will be beautiful years, but then... And he said, don't move until God moves you. And I asked him, and how will I know that God is moving me? And he said, because things will go beautifully, and then they won't be beautiful anymore. Things will be turned upside down. And when that happens, he said, you may remember that God is now moving you. And if you move at that time, you'll go to something better. But if you move yourself before that, you will go to something worse Mm. or lower. And that is what happened. And the Noe Foundation was formed in that last year. And they then gave me an offer, which was very generous and beautiful, just at the nick of time. 
it came, the offer came and was acceptable. We had to negotiate it. I also took istikhara. I did istikhara. I asked God to give me the right decision. And I talked to probably over 12 sheikhs, mm. Sufi sheikhs. Mm-hmm. And they said, no, go, go do this. Right. And so in August 2000, I come back to Chicago. And that begins a very new chapter of my life. And I must say that it was beautiful. And it remains beautiful to this day. Right. And I'm thankful to God, you know, that he has been so generous to me. Mm. So in your absence, how do you see, or when you came back in 2000, how has the community mm. changed by that time? In your, <clears throat> excuse me, in your estimation? Um, Sheikh Hamza was always, we would always meet okay. every right. year, at least You're so getting a pulse of sort of what's happening. No, not oh, really, okay. but um, I remember he came in 1998, and I was with another sheikh at that time. My sheikh, Muhammad Abu Bakr, was ailing that year, so he couldn't come to pilgrimage. And this sheikh, whose name was Shadli, his name was Shatrab, he's another Eritrean Ahlul Bayt, and we were in Masjid al khif and he said, I, we knew Sheikh Hamzid was there. This was after Arafat. And he said, go outside and meet Sheikh Hamza. So I get up in Masjid al khif which has how many thousands of people in it. He didn't say, go out this door or that door. I just go out a door. And there was Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Wow. And Sheikh Hamza Yusuf then took me to his camp. <clears throat> and in his camp, I saw giants. One of them was Usama Kanan. Another one was Mustafa Davis. Another one was Tahir Abdullah. There were others. Sheikh Hamza comes back with me. He meets Shadli. Shadli says, come and pray Fajr with us, which he did. But um, I was just amazed. At, Look at these people. And what is Islam doing in America? And it's getting these incredible uh, converts. Right. So that was a big thing. And then Sheikh Hamza said, you've got to come back. And so I said, okay, I will come next year. That was 1999. I came back on May 31st, 1999, remembering the days of Allah in California. Yes. Uh, I gave a speech there. I was extremely unhappy with my speech. I just knew that I am like one of the sleepers in the cave. And I've come out of the cave and... I don't know this world. Yeah, I don't know. Right. I don't know this language anymore. I don't. And then also there are all these Muslims. Right. And America hadn't been like that. Right. When I had left America, the Muslim population was still relatively small. Right. But it had boomed mm-hmm. during the 1980s and 1990s. And uh, therefore, I asked, asked Imam Zaid and Sheikh Hamza, I said, I, don't, I didn't do well here. I told them, I don't know these people anymore. I don't even know how to talk to them. And I want you to be kind to me and to give me a seminar to teach me what I need to know so I can do da'wah there, here. Mm-hmm. So we got together in England, in Leicester, in August of 1999, a few months later. And um, they didn't do it that way. They had me talk and they had Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad talk and Imam Zaid and Sheikh Hamza and Sheikh Muhammad al Yaqubi and others. And that's actually where the Noe Foundation was proposed. But um, that was a historical meeting, and Mm -hmm. I have notes on it. And we really talked about the way to translate, what not to do, what to do, use the word God, um, other things like that. And um, so uh, it was clear to me in 1999 when I came back that I'm not ready yet. But then I think uh, by the time that, 2000 came around um it was a steep learning curve and um it was very beneficial uh the majestic quran also came out at yes. the same time right. uh that the Noe foundation was part of that as you know yes and that is a very good translation Sidi abdul hakim winter being the main yeah. translator there um well, then of course 9 11 happens yeah. and that was a horror and I actually felt something was going to happen because I had loved uh, Ahmed Shah Mas'ud, who was one of the best of all the Mujahids in Afghanistan. And uh, we loved him, and he had our moral support. And uh, he was killed two days before that by a suicide bomber 
And I just felt like something is going down. Mm. Because Ahmed Shah Mas'ud, as long as he is in Afghanistan, then nobody can do much. Because he is just strategically and tactically too effective. And he doesn't mm. belong to anyone. That's one of the things. He didn't belong to anyone. And then, of course, 9-11 happens, and I was bewildered. I was hurt. I was shocked like everybody was. And then I felt like, you know, maybe we're not going to be able to do anything here. But, you know, again, it's immediately you've got to speak. So I find myself on television and going here and going there. And I don't think I did especially well, but you get, uh, you, you, you begin to learn, you know, how to do these things. Right. And um, then, alhamdulillah, we, uh, you know, it's a long right. uh, story, but I think um, one that is um, of great benefit and um, always learning. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most important that's right. thing. That's right. I mean, so... I would I would disagree mm -hmm. in terms of your assessment of your you, you know you how you did because my, the first time <laughs> you hear you is I think uh, I want to say Isna two thousand two, but uh, and so I that's that in Isna two thousand two uh, two thousand as well right but so, I, that I don't yeah I yeah. don't remember um, but I do remember <clears> yeah two thousand two <throat> vividly but uh, uh, and you mentioned remembering the days of Allah that's at the now, well, at that time it was Zaytuna Institute, now Zaytuna mm -hmm. College, but mm -hmm. um, I remember hearing about that seminar, wanting to attend, mm -hmm. unfortunately not being able to. But anyway, so yeah, it, it's, it's a, it, it, you're learning, and certainly I think 9-11, the events of 9-11, and how the community begins to respond to it, um, I mean, that's, you want to talk about trial by fire. Right? And of course, you are one of the people that organized that yes. tremendous uh, retreat we had in Navasado, Texas. It, right. And that was also a big thing, really, because that in that, uh, Dr. Jackson was there, I was there, Ingrid Matson was there, yes. Kamran Bajwa, others were there. And Dr. I think Kahira. the the sorry Professor Kahira, yes. remember? And I really feel that the presentations we gave there were of a pivotal nature. How much they may or may not have affected people, I don't know. But it was a really, if I could say, transformative for a for lot us, of people. For us, it was very transformative. Wow. And, and it's so humbling to hear mm -hmm. that. But mm -hmm. I've heard you say very positive things about that retreat. It remains one of the highlights of sort of the little I've done uh, in terms of the community. But uh, thank you for saying that. Yeah, that, but that was. And that, that was May 2002, to put it in perspective, mm -hmm. in terms of where we are uh, in the timeline, as it were. So people are still, we're still sort of navigating how we're going to um, you know, uh, like communicate and deal in this changed landscape after nine eleven. Um, so now, um, so now again, your work at Now We Foundation is you're teaching classes in the Chicago land area, uh, or at that time was it Benedictine? Uh, no, it was yeah. Chicago land. Chicago land that includes Benedictine right, and other course. things. Right. Uh, we taught in many different venues. Sometimes we taught outside of Chicago. Okay. Uh, I was in the Noe Foundation from 2000 to 2011. Okay. And then after that, I began to take more of an independent um, uh, approach. And that's sort of where I am now. I love what I'm doing now. I don't belong to any organization or any institution. And I would pray that God enables me to be a supporter of all good institutions Yes. And all good undertakings, uh, not to uh, have anything but the best of opinions about them. And, you know, to be someone who, to the extent that I'm able, supports them and what they do. Right. The things that people like Dr. Jackson does and Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, who really is a man without peer, and Imam Zaid, who is another person that has no uh, peer, you know, these are amazing accomplishments, and I am honored, um, you know, by the fact that we are contemporaries of such great people. Absolutely. And um, and to bring it home for us, I mean, you know, you teach a class, um, you know, at Tatleaf here in mm -hmm. Chicago, 
Uh, I did teach yeah. it for some time, and I hope that I can come back to teach it again. Uh, because of my engagements this last year, I just haven't had the time. I've right. been traveling too much. That's right. That's right. But, and I will be traveling for the rest of the year. But uh, I do support Tetleaf, and I love what they do. And teaching that class has been one of the great pleasures of my life. Uh, those of you who are teachers, uh, and you can sympathize with this from the, uh, the work you do, you know, we learn from what we do. That's right. And that's one of the main reasons why we love to do it, because I am a perpetual student. That's right. I mean, Zucky is a professor of media, you know, right? I mean, and you interacting with students, Zucky, right? I mean, that very informs cool. so much of what you do or how you approach subjects. Uh, yeah, very much so, yeah. Yeah. But uh, so so that's kind of where you are now. Um, but in terms of um, any particular oh, uh, works or books that you're working on right now, I know you're – so you, you went back, you, you added to and – fit and I, I, well, th- like the dissertation. Mm-hmm. And it was recently published again. So as, the, the, the dissertation right. I made into a book. Yes. Malik and Medina. Yes. Islamic Legal Reasoning in the Formative Period. It was published by Brill in 2013. Uh, it is a new book. It's not the dissertation. Yeah. Um, I tried to bring into the book all of the literature, secondary and primary, that was relevant that had appeared over the last more than 30 years. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that literature is extremely valuable, especially the work of a great scholar who writes in German, Miklos Muranyi, who studied the manuscripts of Kairouan for 30 years. And uh, his work is in German, and I'm able to bring that into English in my book. Right. And that work is extremely valuable. And it puts the discussion of my book on a completely higher level and stronger foundation than it ever had before. And, uh, and there are other things as well. So Malik and Medina is, I just wanted to, try to do justice to the dissertation. I thank God that he gave me that dissertation. I believe that he was gracious to me in that. Um, But I didn't publish it for all those years because I wanted to be able to reassess it Mm. and in the light of traditional learning. And that's one of the things I was able to get with the sheikhs that I had, you know, in Jeddah because they were traditional sheikhs. And so I can get the tradition, learn the tradition, so uh, I wanted to now do the book right. and make it a book. And you, so you can compare the dissertation in the book. You'll see they're very different. Yeah. Essentially, the conclusions will be similar, but right. the book also spells things out better Agreed. because also right. I'm more mature and I understand the implications better than I understood them as a graduate student. Right, right. Yeah, having so, read both. I mean, uh, there's a... I mean, because of Brill, it, there tends to be, for a lot of people, a sort of a prohibitive sort of price tag on the book. But I think that, uh, inshallah, well, soon, hopefully, it'll yeah, be more Yeah, I'm very sorry about that. No, no, um, it's... Brill worked really well with me. I, yeah. And Brill actually helped me to get the book at a higher level. Right. And uh, Dr. Muhammad Fadl was their proofreader, and his help was absolutely essential wow. to, you know, the success of the final copy. Okay. I also have to thank many other people, Chris Haufi, mm-hmm. uh, Dr. Uh, Asif Quraishi, you know, people who gave tremendous time mm-hmm. to getting that manuscript, you know, in yeah, shape. Yeah, right, right. And, uh, you know, I, I, really, I, I really appreciate, you know, the selfless contributions of, of these people. Right. Um, are, are you still working on the sort of pre-Columbian roots of Islam in America? Or you... I, I gave presentations at yeah. Princeton and the University of New York, New York University, uh, on, and in Princeton I talked about, uh, you know, Muslims in America before Columbus, question mark. And you've no doubt seen me give yes. pre- presentations like that. But uh, I would say 50% of this is new. Okay. And this presentation, because there are things that have come to light in last in the recent years that I didn't know before. Among some of the most important of those is the fact that the earliest Americans uh, were African-looking people. Mm-hmm. 
people who lived 13,000 years ago, 12,000 years ago. And this shows the importance of the currents of the sea. And the point that I make now very strongly, I had made that point before, is that ancient people traveled by water. Right. They rarely traveled by land. Their preferred mode of transportation was by boat or raft using currents, using rivers, right. trying to stay close to the shore. They didn't have the capacity to go out and to cross the ocean at will, but then often the currents will take them out. So the currents are so important because the currents bring you to America, and the earliest Americans look d distinctly African. Mm -hmm, yeah. So now I emphasize that stronger than I ever did before. Right. I also gave a presentation at State University of New York, which was on uh, Muslims in our American past, 1586 to 1965. And there we talk about Roanoke mm -hmm. and Drake brought over 200 Muslims who had been galley slaves in the Caribbean mm. to Roanoke. That is a historical fact. Right. It's true that he took many of them home, but did he take them all home? We don't know. And the Melungeons and the Lumbee people, whom I wrote an article about, uh, you know, on the Inanawi Foundation. Yes. You know, these are really interesting people who claim to have roots in Roanoke. Right. And they may have Muslim roots. So we talked about that. And who, who is a Melungeon? Abraham Lincoln, Clark Gable, Elvis Presley, um, Tom Hanks. Okay, and then we go to New York City, mm -hmm. where we have the first known Muslim who came across and let's see across the sea. And this is the son of Murad Rais, who was the great Dutch Muslim, who was the president of the Republic of Saleh in Morocco. And this is Anthony van Saleh. And he is one of the founders of New York City. Wow. He is one of the founders of Long Island in Brooklyn. Mm. And he was a Muslim. And who are his descendants? Jacqueline Kennedy, the First Lady, Humphrey Bogart, um, Cornelius Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt family, right. uh, Eli Whitney, Anderson Cooper. <laughs> okay, And this is a yeah. fact. Right. The Melungeons, that's... Could or could be, Got it. could or could not be, but no. I mean, Anderson Cooper is a descendant of Murad Rais, and wow. so is Jacqueline Kennedy, and <laughs> uh, you know. So this is important, especially when we have uh, you know this ideology out there today I was gonna say, that is saying right. that we have nothing to do with this country, we don't That's belong right. here. Then I talk about George Bethune English, George Bethune English, and we have a beautiful picture of him. This man was very close to President Madison, very close to President Adams. Mm. Uh, he was close to the founding fathers. He becomes a Muslim uh, in the early 1800s. He loves Islam. He is sent by President Adams to Istanbul to, with a letter saying that Muslims will be welcomed in America just like Christians. Mm. Yeah, this is also part of our history, and the founding right. fathers and those first generations have amazing things to say about Islam That's right. that are very beautiful. And then we talk about Webb, and we talk about others, and, and then we bring the Africans in, uh, you know, the great uh, African-American Muslims. Uh, you know, so I'm still concerned with that, and I do go to the Gambia every year. Yeah. I have, uh, and I have a lot of experience in West Africa. Alhamdulillah, I love West Africa, but this is something I think which can be proven beyond doubt mm -hmm. that the Mandinkas crossed the Atlantic in about 1312 That's right. and with 2,400 boats. Why did they do that? I believe almost certainly for gold because the kingdom of Mali was the gold capital of the world. And Mali had so much gold. Historians have often wondered where did they get it all? West Africa is rich in gold, but not that rich. Mm. So they must have had other sources. And I would say probably Guiana, Brazil, Mexico. Mm. And that's probably why they went. And that's probably why you have the Olmecs, who are distinctly African people that are there, you know, in 500 B.C. and before. 
So uh, this is still very important. Right. My interest right now right. is in the area of theology. Mm. And um, I am a little bit tardy in producing anything there. I do have a manuscript, which is quite large. But I feel that um, I need to get a better grip on modernism and postmodernism and the truths and fallacies of scientism and things like that so that that can be properly incorporated into the theology. Right. And I need to know where the solid ground is. Uh, one of the things about modern science that uh, is very important, for example, is that modern science is not empirical. It does not use the eyes. It does not use the ears. It does not use the nose, the mouth, or touch. It uses instruments, and it uses measurements, and it uses a type of mathematics, which is brilliant, but a type of mathematics that has no direct connection with objective reality. It is also an effect of Cartesian dualism and this radical dichotomy between the subject and the object. So these things are of theological import. They are. Right. And um, so I want to get my arms around them mm -hmm. a little bit better so that I can speak about them intelligently and hopefully uh, uh, also responsibly. Right. But, you know, theology is the foundation of our worldview. And always in teaching theology, our scholars understood that our articles of faith are elements of reality. And, of course, faith for us is cognitive. Right. Whereas the word faith and belief in English is often volitional. That I will to believe. I want to believe. I'm going to believe. It's an act of will. Right. Whereas for us, no, it's an act of cognition and a profound cognition. And then the will and everything else also comes into it, that I have a him, I have an aspiration to go to the top, to soar and to fly in the spiritual realms mm -hmm. of understanding. So um, theology to me is what I've got my focus on, but I'm not ready to write yet because there's too much I need to learn. This last summer, we have a Zawiya in Spain every summer, uh, last summer, our topic was beauty, the splendor of truth. And this is an extremely important topic. It's a metaphysical topic. And it is why are traditional societies so beautiful? Because they were even first nations in this land. They were beautiful. Right. The way they made their arrows, the way they made their tents, the way they made their clothing, their blankets, everything. Why is that so? Whereas modernism, although it does have in it beauty, but it always has this self-admitted problem of ugliness. And beauty sets you free. Beauty attracts to the truth. Ugliness enslaves you. Right. And so we want to talk about that. And these are things also that have relevance to theology, even though that might not be readily apparent to the listener. Right. And this year, inshallah, we will have a topic of the male and female principle, what it means to be truly human. So... We want to talk about this extremely important issue, but from the standpoint of principle, first principle. And as Aristotle said, you know, any mistake at the level of first principle will be a disaster at the level of particulars. Mm -hmm. And likewise, any disaster at the level of particulars shows that you have a huge problem with uh, principles. And this is one of the issues that we have today in modern scientism, in quantum theory, in Big Bang, Big Bang, Big Bang theory right. may not last more than another decade or so. Right. It's got huge contradictions. So we need to get these foundations clear. And we need to teach this in a way that is understandable mm -hmm. to people, that they can swallow and digest, but also open their eyes to see this world that we live in and to understand it. 
So, Dr. Arm Ryan, I know we've kept we, we've kept you far longer than um, we had intended, and I, I really want to thank you for that. Um, I do want to let our listeners know that um, I think some of Dr. Dr. Armour's papers are still available that he wrote um, under the auspices of the Noah Foundation. Um, the Zawiya that you mentioned is a uh, is a retreat that takes place in the summer. Um, that is zawiya.org. You can get some uh, additional information, not only about that the the retreat, but also about Dr. Armour and his activities through that website. Um, I would also encourage the listeners to a book that we haven't talked about, um, but or you alluded to is your book on uh, Muhammad Alexander Webb. Mm-hmm. Um, a Muslim in Victorian America. Yeah, if you could maybe just maybe a little uh, bit talk about. Well, you know, uh, plays very Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb is uh, one of the earliest known converts to Islam in the United States. There is a book that Brill put out this year on, I don't like the word white, but white converts to Islam. Mm. And the author, who I think his name is Bauer, I might be mistaken, um, you know, he contends that he has studies of about a thousand white converts Mm -hmm. uh, from the early republic until 1975. Um, So there are a lot. And George Bethune English is one of the startling ones. We didn't even know he existed when we wrote the Webb book. Right. Uh, Alexander Russell Webb was an amazing figure, and he converted to Islam in 1888. Uh, He died in 1916. He established a mission in New York City. He had uh, two newspapers. One was a big paper. The other one was a small paper. He spoke at the first World Parliament of Religions here in Chicago Mm -hmm. in 1893. Uh, He was well known in America, and his papers were very popular, by the way, and very well received. But um, one of the things that struck me, when I began to look into Webb, which was in 2000, when I came back uh, and began to work in the Noe Foundation, Mm -hmm. was that this man is a Muslim uh, Forrest Gump. You know, that he is always there in the middle of everything, even though he doesn't intend to be there. And, um, you know, so... Uh, And if you look at the book, I hope you can see that. Yeah. Because in telling the story of Webb, who's born in 1846, you are, I hope, and this is what I try to do, telling the history of the United States. Yeah. Because Webb will be in the middle of it all. That's right. And so we tell about um, the first effective settlement of the United States in New England, the Mid-Atlantic, the South, This is a very important concept, first effective settlement. It pertains to us as Muslims today. We have to get first effective settlement of our culture in this country. Uh, It pertains to blacks in the 1830s. Blacks will have their first effective settlement probably in the 1830s, a little bit later, but that's because of the nature of uh, the um, horror of slavery and how it worked. But uh, with Webb, you tell the history of the Civil War, in a way that you didn't read in school. It's a, it's a different approach. And then also you'll see how the United States develops in the period after that, mm-hmm. in the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And although Webb's conversion to Islam sounds perhaps extraordinary, uh, you'll see that in the context of Victorian America, it wasn't. Wow. And, you know, so I really hope that in telling this story, First of all, we are honoring one of our forefathers, right? Who was a great man and a beautiful man, and he loved the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That there is no question about. And he also was decorated mm-hmm. by Sultan Abdul Hamid with two orders of honor from the Ottoman Empire, and he was also the Ottoman ambassador, mm-hmm. you know, in New York City. So he's a very interesting person and a remarkable person in my view. But also, I really felt that we can tell this book in such a way that American Muslims, whether they come from an immigrant past or a conversion past, Mm -hmm. can have better understanding of who we are and where we have been. And some of the huge crises that we've been through, like the Civil War and slavery, 
and also the First Nations and the massacre of the First Nations, you know, because Webb is there reporting on it, talking about it, you know. So um, I, I really felt that this book serves more than one purpose. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's interesting that when it came out, my editor at Oxford University Press in New York was very enthusiastic. And the book, when it first came out, was in the middle of the New York Review of Books, right up in the upper left-hand corner. So you can't miss it. Mm -hmm. And then it disappears, and it never shows up again. And in fact, um, strangely, yeah. it's like somebody didn't want this book to be sold, and they didn't want it to be known. Mm. Uh, the House of Lords asked me in England to speak about it in 2006, and Oxford University Press in England wanted copies of the book, and Oxford University Press in New York sent them maybe two boxes. And we could have sold 30 boxes there because all kinds of publishers came who wanted to buy boxes of books. Right. So that was kind of interesting to me. I, and well, I think in, in many ways, and I think one in like, I think we can kind of leave on this note in terms of the audience is that, you know, I, what I appreciate about your scholarship among many, 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 many things is the attempt by which, or the attempt you make to, indigenize Islam to America. And I think that even speaking in those terms, at least for me and for a lot of people like me, that, that language, that vernacular even comes in by way of your scholarship, Dr. Omar, really. And, and, uh, and also, I mean, I'd be remiss, Dr. Jackson. And so Dr. You know, Jackson, right. without any question. Right. Uh, Dr. And Dr. Yang. Jackson is my mentor. And also Dr. Suleiman Yang. That's right. These exactly. are mentors for me. Are, I have learned so much from them. Right. But I, so, so I think mm -hmm. that I, I, you know, and, and I, for the listeners, if you read Dr. Omar's articles, you know, the ones that I've mentioned, uh, if you read the web book, you, you'll see that. And I think certainly, you know, given the modern context, like, I mean, I know, you know, like, for example, the rhetoric that's coming from the right wing, um, and, 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 and the Republicans, certainly Trump, um, yeah. the climate of fear that we live in, um, with regards to terrorism and, and, and things like that, the scholarship that, 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 that represents is just invaluable for the Muslim community. And I, I do think that, uh, the study Quran, which, uh, came out, as you know, just recently, right. uh, this is also a major victory and a gift of God, because as Dr. Jackson says in his uh, praise of the book, the Quran since 9-11 has become a public document. And so now we have an extremely scholarly work in superb English with probably not an editorial mistake in the whole book. And we can give this to people and say that this is our book, read it. Right. And Americans are generally scripturalists. Yeah. This is our tradition. So now our scripture is presentable in a very respectable form. Yes. And um, I think that this is so valuable for us now. We need this desperately. Mm. And now we can give the study of Quran to preachers and pastors and our Christian and Jewish and Buddhist and Hindu and atheist and secularist neighbors, and they can see that this book is actually profound. Mm. And this book is really beautiful. And this is what the verse meant. And this is what the verse was understood to mean. Mm. And I have not opened that book since I got it, which was about a week before it was published, but that I have learned something on every page I never knew before. So um, I hope that this turmoil over it will pass yes. and that our community will take a civil and intelligent position on the book, not one based on bigotry, not one based on prejudice, but one that's based on careful study and evaluation and thanks for uh, this work. Well, that's a good place to uh, uh, wrap things up here. What do you think, Pervez? 
I, I agree. I agree. I mean, we could be here for hours, but uh, we, which we already have. So, um, yeah. Well, no, thank you. Uh, I was just going to say thank you, Zucky, but please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, Dr. Omer, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, I know that uh, for both Pervez and I, when, when we knew that we'd have a chance to talk to you, uh, we were both extremely excited. And from my end, I was just, it was just a privilege to just be able to sit and listen to the two of you talk, you know. Well, thank you very much. And it's been an honor, you know, to have your time and to have Parvez's time. And um, may God enable us, you know, to bring our tradition to life. Our tradition is a beautiful tradition, one of the richest in the history of humankind. Mm -hmm. And we have all of the treasures and the wealth that is necessary to make sense of the modern world and the postmodern world. And may God enable us to do that effectively. Bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. Amin. 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 Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Armour. Um, and, and you, yeah, there's just so much for, I think, both us as hosts, Zeki, as well as the listening audience to reflect on. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, please do reach out to us with your comments, your feedback. Uh, Zeki, where can people find us? Well, you can find us on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. You can also email us at diffuse congruence at gmail.com. And uh, we're on iTunes. We're at Stitcher Radio. Please do write us a review. Leave us a star rating. Let people know what you think. Let us know what you think. And we will certainly uh, do everything we can to uh, measure up to your expectations of us. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Omar Farak Abdullah. I'd like to thank my co-host, Pravez Ahmed. Uh, my name is Zaki Hassan. This is Diffuse Congruence, and we will see you next time. <laughs>